Welcome to Mayor Brown's International Arbitration Across the Pond podcast. Each episode is designed to provide insight on legal issues and other matters affecting international arbitration in the UK, US and around the world. The podcast is presented by two of Mayor Brown's international arbitration partners, Quadros Marcodi from the firm's London office and Charles Harris from the firm's Chicago office. You can subscribe to this podcast on all major podcasting platforms, as well as Mayor Brown's YouTube channel. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. We're here today for what we think is our 17th episode of our podcast, uh, Across the Pond. And so international arbitration across the pond, let me, let me get it exactly right. So we, we have a, a special guest today who I'll introduce in, in a second. Um, but before I get to that, you know, one of the things we, we've been doing is, is one of the things we've been doing over, over the course of, of, of the, this podcast is deciding our, our name kind of as, as the name for the podcast during the episode. And Quajo, you know, I was, I was given some, some thought to the name today. In, in light of our guest, and you know he's he's from Ghana. We'll we'll get to that in a, in a second. But also, Fajo, your your name is Ghanaian. I've I've learned that in, in conversations with you, right? Right? Mm-hmm. Is that right? That's and right. And so so yeah. So my ancestry says that you know I have a Ghanaian Ghanaian blood too. So oh, wow. My, so yeah. So <laughs> so, so I, I think we should call this everything Ghana. And and what we'll what we'll hear today is is we'll hear everything about. Of course, we got we got to we got to bring in international arbitration. So <laughs> what we'll hear today is is everything about international arbitration and also domestic arbitration too in Ghana. And um, you know, so 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 that's what I think we should do. How does that uh, sound? That that sounds perfect, Chucky. And <laughs> uh, th- thank you very much for revealing that fascinating fact. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I always felt we had a, an affinity at some sort of level. Right, right, right. Things to explain <laughs> why. So no, that's great to have you um, uh, with us. Uh, and uh, we'll be introducing Isaac soon and hearing a little bit about his background and what he can share uh, with us and our listeners about the arbitration landscape uh, in Ghana. Um, so yeah, without much further ado, I think we should uh, give Isaac the opportunity to uh, introduce himself. He's over here with us in the the London office uh, on a uh, three months, I think it is. Is that right, Isaac? Yeah, that's right. On a three months secondment. Uh, under the ILFA scheme, that's the International Lawyers uh, for Africa scheme, which again, we will be able to talk a little bit more about. But first off, Isaac, yeah, would you just like to say a few words to introduce yourself to our listeners? Right. Thank you very much, Kudu. My name is Isaac Abram Lati. I am an associate at a law firm called Samu Kujetu and Associates, which is a leading dispute resolution law firm in Accra, Ghana. I am here on secondment at Mayor Brown under the International Lawyers for Africa Secondment Scheme. Uh, it aims to second talented lawyers from African countries to leading law firms in the UK and in other jurisdictions. It's been a wonderful experience. It has exposed me to so much enlarging my practice. So it's been great to be here. Uh, That is great to hear, uh, Isaac. Um, And yeah, hopefully you can uh, share some of your experience, knowledge and and educate us uh, and educate those who are listening in uh, about your practice, about your experience, particularly how that relates to to international arbitration in in Ghana. So I am a dispute resolution practitioner. I do domestic arbitration and civil litigation in Ghana. I just completed my LLM at Queen Mary University of London, where I did comparative and international dispute resolution. So I've sought to veer into the international arbitration space. And um, over the past years, my experience in domestic arbitration has revolved around dispute revolving manufacturing disputes, property disputes, and various commercial disputes. And so this is a great avenue for me to broaden my horizon within the arbitration space. Fantastic. And and what I hope then, (coughs) through the course of this discussion, you give us some perspectives on uh, on arbitration in Ghana, and uh, particularly uh, you, Chucky, should give us some 
interesting counterpoints and comparisons with with how that uh, reflects yeah. or compares with the position across the pond in the United States. Absolutely. So, so one one of the things, and, and I, and you know, you mentioned you mentioned civil litigation, and you know, I want to understand kind of in, in Ghana, what how how is the court system generally? Can you can you just discuss the court system before before we get to arbitration? Right. So Ghana, as you may know, is a common law jurisdiction which has the laws based on judicial precedents. So the court is divided into two folds. We have the superior courts of judicature and then the lower courts of judicature. The superior courts of judicature is made up of the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, and the High Court. So the Supreme Court is the APES Court which has the original jurisdiction in the enforcement and interpretation of the constitution. It also has an appellate jurisdiction in hearing appeals, which comes from the Court of Appeal. Now, the Court of Appeal only has an appellate jurisdiction and the, commercial, the, the high court is the court that hears all original matters relating to civil action in the country. Uh, thanks a lot, Isaac. And again, by way of general perspective, you able to give us a bit of a background of the economy in Ghana? What are the key industries, areas of development, and so on? Right. So Ghana is predominantly a natural resource-based economy. So most of the sectors of the economy revolves around natural resources. Now, the leading aspect of the economy is in the extractive industry, where we have mining showing predominantly. Ghana currently is the leading producer of gold in Africa. Ghana overtook South Africa in the year 2019 as the leading producer of gold. Ghana produces diamond, bauxite, and manganese. Agriculture also plays a significant role in the Ghanaian economy. In 2021, um, agriculture contributed to 19% of Ghana's GDP. And this is particularly so as you know, the country is also um, the second largest producer of cocoa in the world, second to the Cote d'Ivoire. And so agriculture, mining plays a key role. Now the, the country also has a growing oil and gas industry. Since the inception of um, the commercial find of oil in Ghana in 2007, the oil industry has been growing in leaps and bounds. So after 2007, there was another discovery in 2009 where Springfield discovered 1.5 billion barrels of oil in the country. Subsequently, in 2021, there's been another fine of oil by ENI, which is about 500 to 700 million barrels of oil. So that's for the growing industry within the oil and gas space. In terms of infrastructure, the country has an infrastructure deficit. And so there's always the constant need to develop infrastructure facilities in the country. So there are various projects that are going on in the country. And one of them that is of interest to me is the Tema in Pakadan Railway Network, which is an ambitious project to connect the Tema ports to the northern part of Ghana. That is a project that was being funded by the Indian government. And since I'm in London, I would also want to talk about the Kumasi International Airport, which is being financed by the UKEF. It's a project to expand the airport to make it an international standard. And that is currently ongoing, which is about a $300 million project. So in a snapshot, that is briefly the, the economy of Ghana in perspective. Okay, that, that's interesting to hear. So is, is arbitration gaining any ground in Ghana? Yes, I, I would say that arbitration is gaining ground in Ghana. And this is particularly so as the Ghanaian court is highly loaded, particularly with the commercial courts. It's, is really loaded with lots of backlog of cases. So a report of the judicial service in 2017, 2018 legal year showed that there was about 12,000 cases that was pending for determination. And so that has really contributed to the significance of arbitration in the country. And then there's a seeming perception of lack of distracts within the judiciary. Uh, this stems from a 2015 documentary that was aired by an investigative journalist called Anas Arimeyao, which had 22 circuit court judges being suspended for various acts of corruption and 12 high court judges being implicated. And so foreign investors tend to resort to an alternative and arbitration is that alternative. 
Another reason that has propelled arbitration is due to the technical nature of litigation in Ghana. And one of such instances that I do recall is a decision by the Supreme Court in 2017 where foreign investors who had invested $60 million on a promissory note which was guaranteed by a national investment bank could not enforce that guarantee simply because they couldn't indicate their address on the writs and they lost that case. Now, some people have the perception that that was an attempt by, by the judiciary to save the investment bank because Ghana was going through banking crisis at that time and it was likely that if you know, these investors had won that suit, that, that bank would have collapsed. And so these you know, are the reasons that has propelled arbitration you know, in the country. Oh, thank you, Isaac. So it's, it sounds like there's a number of factors then that really push the use of arbitration uh, and its, its increasive use uh, in the in the Ghanaian legal system. Um, what are the main areas uh, and or industries which which give rise to particular uh, needs or uh, demand for arbitration? So for the areas, I'll say that the construction industry in particular, you know, unlike the English courts where you have a specialized construction court which has judges that have the competence to hear construction disputes, you don't tend to find most judges really having the expertise within the construction sector. And so within the construction industry, there's normally a resource to arbitration because the party players will want the expertise of the arbitrator to be able to resolve the disputes that involve highly technical matters. Now, uh, disputes with <coughs> energy is also referred to arbitration. And also labor disputes, because in, in the Ghana Labor Act, there's, there's a laid down procedure for dispute resolution and arbitration is one of them that is recognized. So the National Labor Commission often hears you know, arbitration matters. <coughs> Issues regarding mining, insurance, maritime and shipping, these are the areas that often see arbitration being used. Uh, thanks a lot, Isaac. And that's quite exciting for me, A, to, to hear your description of the various major infrastructure projects and investments going on uh, and speaking as a, uh, a lawyer with, with a construction background, very conscious <laughs> that big projects uh, can often lead to, to big disputes, uh, and also how in, international arbitration is a, a key element in some of those industries of uh, parties both mitigating their risk and then providing for resolving disputes uh, when they arise. So yes, it sounds like a, a very interesting market. What is the legislative framework that, that governs arbitration in Ghana? Right. So... The legislative framework that governs arbitration in Ghana is the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act of 2010. That's Act 798. Now, this act was passed in 2010 when there was a need for a restructuring of our arbitration framework, because previously we had the 1960 Arbitration Act, and that was far outmoded. And so there was the need to bring our arbitration framework you know, in, in line with international trend and practices. So just pausing there, Isaac, the 1960 Act, was that based on a one of the earlier English Arbitration Act? So the Arbitration Act 1960 was based on the old English Arbitration Act of 1899. And there was the need for it to be restructured so that it could come to terms with international best practices. So yes, the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act was passed. The Act really models, um, mirrors the model uh, um, law of the UN, and it provides for separability of an arbitration agreement. It, it recognizes party autonomy in various ways. And it also incorporates various principles such as competence, competence where the tribunal has the competence to determine its own jurisdiction. So that was the reason why the act was enacted. Uh, thank you. So it, essentially, it sounds as if it brought the legislation up to speed with um, you know, most of the uh, the key global standards and trends with regard to international arbitration, uh, certainly as they were uh, around around 2010. Uh, one thing I was wondering, and this is what on a recent trip to Nigeria, I'd seen uh, there in the process of of updating their arbitration legislation there and. Uh, obviously, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, close neighbours, um, many parallels across legal systems, etc. Uh, and uh, you know, a few of the interesting innovations uh, we saw um, that the 
Nigerian draft act has has, has put in. Uh, one is to make express provisions governing third party funding in relation to international arbitration. Another was to introduce the concept of a dispute review uh, tribunal, essentially, uh, as an, an appellate level in place of the courts to potentially review uh, review awards. Um, all quite interesting and and innovative, and obviously it remains to be seen uh, what final final form that that act takes. Um, but do you think there are particular challenges or, or setbacks or issues uh, in Ghana which perhaps the the act doesn't address, and perhaps reform might be needed, or do you think it broadly uh, covers what it needs to cover? Well, I think that um, our arbitration act has a few challenges that maybe. We, we have to look at in due course, because in terms of arbitrability, you know, the, the provision on arbitrability is too broad in respect of national interest matters. So the act provides that issues regarding public interest and national interest cannot be subject to an arbitration. And the, the question is that the act does not define what public interest is or what national interest is. So the, the mischief then is that if there's any disputes against the government, and it goes through arbitration to the end, because arbitrability is one of the grounds for which um, an, an award can be set aside, there could be a leeway you know, for any government agency to say that, okay, this dispute about energy was in respect of the public interest, and so the award should be set aside. So I think that's a, something that needs some bit of a clarity. And then, then another thing is, disputes relating to the environment. Of, of course, I see that the emerging trend is that matters which were previously not considered to be arbitrable, like insolvency disputes and all that, in recent times are, are being deemed arbitrable. And this is particularly so as we are moving in, in, in a space where the carbon market is catching up on Africa. So the question will be that, you know, do matters relating to carbon disputes um, fall within that scope of disputes that are not arbitrable simply because they have an element of environmental relation. But for me, one of the critical things that we need to look at in our Arbitration Act is Section 40, which deals with the determination of preliminary points of law. Because I, I see it to be given room <coughs> for excessive interference by the court. Now, under the such section, any party who is aggrieved on any preliminary point of law because it affects their rights, could apply to the high court for a determination. I mean, which is, which is right, but when you compare it with provisions like the English Arbitration Act, there are certain blockades that tend to prevent an abuse of that provision. So for example, under the English Arbitration Act, you can only file such applications in the court when both parties agree for it to be sent to the court, or in the alternative, when you, you seek leave of the tribunal or you seek leave of the court. And even with that, you must demonstrate that <coughs> save cost or, or you, you are bringing it timelessly. So that is one of the grounds that we, we, we should be looking at because in the absence of such barriers, you would have an arbitration being commenced and parties filing applications here and there under the guise of it being under preliminary points of law. And it elongates the process. I mean, I must admit that under the act, the, the, the tribunal can proceed in determining the matter in spite of the fact that a party may file an, an application for preliminary points of law determination. But you find yourself in a situation where you are juggling two things at the same time. You are in the courts dealing with a preliminary point of law and then you are in the arbitral tribunal. And that, that, that really doesn't augur well with cost implications. Yeah, I, I could certainly well, see I think, how that could be, could be disruptive. Um, I was in, interested. I'm, I want to I want to ask a quick question about that before before we move on. So so the the points about the preliminary points of law that people usually I guess it's some type of let's call it interlocutory means to to get it before the court. Like what type of issues are are, are logically supposed to be covered under under that provision that that allows you to go to the court in, in that situation? Well, so the, you know that the provision of the act says that you know an applicant can apply to the court to have a point of law which substantially affects them okay. in the course of the proceedings. You would have expected that since the, the, the caption is a preliminary point of law determination, this should relate to matters that are you know, contingent on the arbitration, issues such as 
you know, matters regarding jurisdiction or anything of that sort. But the way the act is couched, it presupposes that at any point in the course of the arbitration, if there's any point of law that substantially affects the rights of a party, that could be grounds for you to file an application before the court. And so it, mm -hmm. it could cover any, any aspect of the proceedings. And that is the mischief that I think should be looked at. And, and yeah, I was just going to ask um, Chucky, uh, in your experience in, in the US under the FAA, um, how are those equivalent provisions uh, operated and used? Is that something that there is perceived as something that can cause the sort of disruption uh, and duplicative uh, adjudication of issues that Isaac was just describing, or does it tend to work work pretty well there? Well, there actually is no such provision. <laughs> you've got the right and idea I'll, and, 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 and i'm thinking to myself as he's talking hey that's interesting yeah. you know, i wouldn't mind having, having that to use it you know in my toolbox from the english mm -hmm. perspective you know how mm -hmm. likely are you to succeed on a preliminary point of law application for the english courts uh, yeah and and i think you know you you hit on um you know some of the, the very important safeguards that certainly have evolved both both out of the wording of the um, the 1996 Arbitration Act uh, in England, but also the way that that's been applied uh, by the courts, because they they have shown a, a track record of being reluctant to interfere, of of being uh, in in being really minded only only to engage with those sort of issues where they're they're absolutely crucial uh, to to the arbitration itself, and and also are are not. Uh, susceptible to be efficiently dealt with by the tribunal itself. The the, the underlying principle, um, which uh, you know very, very much uh, sits beneath uh, everything in the the Arbitration Act, is that you know if parties have have opted to re re refer their disputes to arbitration, that is where those disputes should be dealt with. And and this is is potentially dangerous. And I, I can see I can see from from you know from Chucky's uh, US perspective. How you know one approach might be just not to permit this mm. sort of provision at all because it just mm. cuts that out. But I think where it does exist, uh, it, it's important that it be be restricted. But I think broadly speaking, the English courts have done a pretty good job of restricting uh, their willingness to act there to, to really to uphold the arbitral process. Mm. Yeah, oh, that's great. I mean, look, I think I think the uh, I mean, party arbitration is a is a parties agree to, to arbitration and, you know, it's a creature of contract. And if you agree to decide a dispute in arbitration, then effectively, I mean, you should have that dispute decided in arbitration. So it's interesting to me that, that there is, at least it seems like the English courts have limited it, there is that ability to have a, an issue of law potentially decided by the court while you're in the midst of an arbitration. I mean, I think I think it is interesting. And I think at least some in limited circumstances, it, it could be effective. If, if we had that to use in the US. Uh, thanks a lot. So yeah, moving on now, I think, to the question on uh, arbitration institutions. Um, Isaac, would you be able to tell us a little bit about which institutions, or both on the domestic arbitration and the international arbitration front, are, are most active uh, in Ghana and, and how effective uh, you perceive them to be? Well, so then, under the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act of Ghana, <coughs> The government was supposed to establish an ADR center that would have um, a center focused on arbitration. But it's, it's rather unfortunate that to date that center has not been established. So what we have is the Ghana Arbitration Center that is a private um, organization, but that's the most predominant arbitra arbitration institution in Ghana. So most domestic arbitration are resolved at the Ghana Arbitration Center. There is a novel uh, arbitration institution also called the Ghana ADR Hub that are also making inroads in the ar arbitration space in Ghana. So that is on the domestic front. And, and maybe I should also talk about the National Labor Commission, because even though they are a regulatory authority, they also facilitate the arbitration of labor disputes. So in that sense, they are also an institution that is worth mentioning. In terms of the international scene, what we do see often is the LCIA and then the ICC, then sometimes the PCA for ad hoc arbitrations. Yeah. And take, taking that, the support from uh, arbitration institutions, which is obviously very important, and also taking uh, what you mentioned earlier about the, the ability uh, of, of the courts to 
support arbitration, uh, deal with uh, particular issues and so on. Now, that really leads to uh, the next important question, Isaac, uh, and that is, overall, how effective are the courts in Ghana in supporting arbitration? <clears throat> well, there's a mechanism. I mean, there's the, the framework provides various supports that the courts should provide to arbitration in Ghana. So the courts are supposed to determine the challenge of the appointment of a sole arbitrator, remove an arbitrator, you know, make determinations of points of law, like we've already said, you know, determination regarding fees. And even with, the, with regards to the enforcement, the, the, the courts hears matters for enforcement because under the law, an, an, an arbitration award is enforced the same way as, as a judgment of the court. But the problem is that I have already alluded to the fact that the courts are loaded and packed with cases. And so their effectiveness then comes to play here. The question of their effectiveness really comes to play. Enforcement, the, the supports that they can provide is challenged with the constraints that they have with case load. And so, yes, in some, in some instances, when you are applying for interim measures and it is, and it is very urgent, they are able to expedite you know, such, such matters and then grant you relief. But other than that, you still fall within the same constraints of you know, the courts not having the capacity to deal with matters urgently. And that I think is a problem. Uh, is there any specialist uh, list or spe uh, um, specialized judges to, to deal with international arbitration or will arbitration matters so, simply go? So, so all those matters will go before the commercial courts. All those matters will go before the commercial court. There's no specialist judge that deals with arbitration. It's, it's, it's deemed that as a commercial judge, you should be able to, you know, resolve these matters or grant relief in respect of arbitration. So there isn't any specialized judge that handles arbitration, so to speak. All the commercial court judges should be able to do that. Yeah. But before we move on to the next question, why, why, let me just ask, why is there such a, a backlog on, on the cases in, in court in Ghana? Well, I would say that, you know, litigation is the predominant form of dispute resolution in Ghana. And so you have so many parties re 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 resolving their matters through that. And the, the publication or the, 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 the promotion of ADR in the country is not so much developing. And so there's the need for you know, various stakeholders to promote ADR so that people can resolve their cases, you know, out of the country. Then another constraint will be infrastructural facilities. You know, the, the, the courts are not really well equipped to handle the various cases that are coming. But in recent times, the government made an inroad. There's been a construction of a 42 court complex in, in, in Accra, the city. But that's as far as it can go. You know, all the well-resourced facilities are in the, in the capital. So if you have places out of the capital where cases, you know, are overloaded in the in, in, in the commercial courts, you cannot really have matters determined expeditiously. So the main reason is the lack of promotion of ADR and then the lack of facilities in the country. Okay, all right, that's interesting to hear. So are are there any recent developments in relation to arbitration in Ghana that you want to share with us? Right. I mean, in terms of recent developments, I would say that. What really comes to mind is the current inclination of parliament to enact laws that contain compulsory arbitration you know, um, mechanisms. So in some sectors, for example, like the banking industry, under the Banks and Specialized Deposits and Taking Act, you know, any dispute that relates to the revocation of a license of a bank has to be resolved through arbitration. And that that is a recent development. I think that the policy rationale behind it is that there are certain industries where these matters should be resolved as quickly as possible to 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 get the economy back on its footing. And so, you know, there's there's been a conscious effort to include arbitration, mandatory arbitration provisions in the legislation. Another instance is the Minerals and Mining Act. <clears throat> Any Ghanaian citizen who has their mining license revoked can only resolve their dispute through arbitration. And you know the, the, the act makes that compulsory arbitration in there. The much as it's, it's an ideal policy, the challenge with it is that currently in the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act, there is no provision for a framework governing mandatory arbitration. Now, 
I, I, I just noticed that in the English Arbitration Act, I think section 94, there is that kind of provision governing mandatory arbitration. Because the debate is that arbitration you know, revolves around consent. Consent is the pivotal element of arbitration. And so if you have a status compelling you to arbitrate, then the question is, what is the arbitration agreement? You know, what seat would, would the arbitration be held at? Who will be the, the, the arbitrator? How many arbitrators will be appointed? Um, what arbitral institution will determine such matters? But what you see under the English Arbitration Act is that there's a clear provision that says that for the purpose of such arbitrations, the, the, the legislation itself will serve as an arbitration agreement. And so, so long as the legislation applies to you, it is deemed that you consented to arbitration. Now, it could be said that, okay, the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act of Ghana is, is, is an equivalent legislation. And so that, that should be the arbitration agreement. But there are other questions that demand answers. Because in recent times, you know, in respect of the banks and specialized deposit taking act, there was a revocation of the license of a bank. The receiver who was appointed to receive um, the, the bank brought an application against certain directors for certain more practices. And they filed a counterclaim concerning how their license was revoked. So the court was met with the dilemma of referring them to the mandatory arbitration. But the question was, there is no provision under the act regarding how this should go, as to who will be appointed as the arbitrator, how many arbitrators will be appointed. The judge faced with this challenge appointed an arbitrator for the parties, a sole arbitrator for the parties. And the arbitrator who was a highly experienced Supreme Court former judge, when he was seized with jurisdiction to hear the matter, wrote an interim award to say that he didn't have jurisdiction because arbitration is consensual. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a problem. That you know, yeah. The policy is to make sure that disputes are resolved expeditiously, and yet there's no provision or there's no mechanism. And, and so I think that there should be you know, a, a reform to the ADR Act to make provision for that. I do see, for example, that the Agricultural Holdings Act of England has various provisions of how these things will be done. Normally, this is used in compensation matters where there's a need to pay compensation. So arbitration will be this. This authority will appoint um, you know, the arbitrator if parties cannot agree. So I think that is where we should look at. That is a development that is coming with mm -hmm. Parliament compelling parties to arbitrate, but there's the need for them to also consider the framework within which you know, the parties will arbitrate under such circumstances. Now, an, another development in terms of the case law is the scope of non-signatories parties' rights under the Act. So under the Alternative Dispute Resolution Act of Ghana, and I believe that this applies to some other jurisdictions, it is only a party to an arbitration agreement who can challenge the award. That is how the act is couched. So this was a case where there was an arbitration. The award made certain findings that affected the interests of a third party. And the third party brought an application to the court challenging the award. On, on the face of the, the section regarding challenge, it, you would have thought that it's only a party to the arbitration agreement that could challenge the award. But the court went ahead to say that so long as the award affected you know, that person's rights, that person had the, the power to bring an application to challenge the award. So that's a, a step in the right direction where you see the courts fleshing out you know, the Arbitration Act to make sense of its provision. And I think that this should probably also extend to non-signatory parties to arbitration and how they can be, be, be brought into play. I see that there's, there, there's a recent development in England regarding the, the, the scope of non-signatory parties to an arbitration agreement to participate or even to initiate an arbitration proceedings. And I think maybe Kojo can inform me much better on that. <laughs> there is a recent decision of the, the courts. Um, well, just before we get to that, thank you very much, Isaac. And, you know, I, I certainly, the situation you described there with regard to uh, third party uh, challenge and so on, um, it's, it's something certainly that we've in, encountered in relation to um, the Nigerian system. Uh, also, again, staying in West Africa under the Ohada uh, scheme for, for, for international arbitration. 
uh, because under that they have the pro specific provision for third party opposition. Um, I forget the particular clause of the Uniform Arbitration Act that uh, that it's, it's covered under, but uh, it, it, it provides that the third party um, can oppose a an arbitral award which is made, which affects it. Now, me speaking personally, I, I'm I, I find the whole the whole concept um, so, something I'm not entirely comfortable with. I think uh, the fact is, with arbitration, what what parties seek when they uh, execute an arbitration agreement? is they seek effective resolution of their dispute, they seek certainty, and they seek that by way of the uh, the, tr the tribunal and the mechanism that they have selected. You know, as Chucky uh, mentioned earlier, it's a it's a creature of contract. I think where where provisions uh, start to come into play, which then, then would allow a third party, wasn't a signatory to that contract, did not consent to that particular mechanism, that selection of the tribunal, et cetera, then, um, then implementing a challenge that then takes away from the certainty that each of the parties have contracted to to, to achieve uh it means that the ultimate resolution of the dispute is is then delayed and postponed because they've got a, a decision uh by way of arbitration but then that is then subject to a further uh challenge process um and i think it's also not particularly satisfactory for the, for the third party because although they do get uh the the ability to challenge that is after the arbitration uh, has, has already has already taken its course uh, and then then there is a, a binding decision uh, in place now uh, Isaac I'll admit you've you've, you've slightly um bold googly to me on this one oh. because you asked me about the <laughs> and I think you know you're, you're getting me back from the, the the tricky question I might have asked earlier uh, but no right. so I, what, what I can't dis discuss is the is the actual specific um uh, de developments in England because they, um, this is all an, an education for me. I'll have to go up, go away, and, and read that after this. <laughs> but I do know that you know the the, whole, the concept of third party arbitration, sorry, third party challenge uh, in relation to arbitration decisions uh, is is something that I think is 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 in in a lot of ways generates a lot of tensions with certainly the. Um, set up with regard to international arbitration as it exists certainly uh in england but also in other uh commonwealth uh jurisdictions but as i say that you know, that did um did attract a lot of comments in nigeria and i think it was the um federal internal revenue service and stat oil case where the revenue services were um were impacted and uh therefore had a right to to challenge uh it's generates uh, a lot of discussion in relation to the Ohada provisions, although I think certainly in French domestic arbitration, that's more of a familiar concept. So I think you know, following from the uh, the Napoleonic Code, the Francophone sort of approach uh, to, to jurisprudence, that's something that can be accommodated perhaps uh, perhaps more easily. But, but overall, it's something I'm not comfortable with because I think you, your, your arbitration should primarily be within the four corners of the the contract and the consent of the parties to the arbitration agreement. It's it's their consent that gives rise to it, and it sh should be within that consent that it's then conducted. Chucky, I don't know if you've got any views. I, no, uh, so so I I I think I think I, I pretty much agree with you. I think one thing though is that, and, and we're talking about basically about enforcement is that. You no, know, the parties need to make sure that that when they're asking the arbitrators for for uh, you know various judgments and for various remedies that they make sure that those that those remedies they're asking for are tailored to kind of um, the 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 uh, you know the parties themselves mm. and and how if only affect the rights of the parties themselves is is I guess kind of kind of how I would frame it and it seems like to me if you can find your award to issues that only affect those parties. You make it very difficult for a third party, at least, to colorably argue that, hey, this shouldn't be enforced for some reason because it affects my rights. So I think I think if you tailor the award and the remedies appropriately, you kind of mitigate that that issue. But you know, I, I think I think I do agree with you. Yeah, that all makes makes good sense, gents. And so switching um onto another topic here, uh, I'd like to I uh, have a few words, if I may, uh, Isaac, on the subject of treaty arbitration. So, uh, first off, uh, what are the protections that Ghana offers 
uh, to foreign investors by way of investment treaties? Uh, and do do some of these protections involve uh, arbitration as a means for, um, for, for parties who claim a violation to uh, in, assert and enforce those rights? Right. So then Ghana is a party to the International Convention on the Settlement of Investment Disputes. Mm -hmm. So it means that parties who, investors who, you know, are in countries that Ghana has signed a bilateral investment agreement with can resolve their disputes through the exit mechanism for the resolution of investment disputes. Now, in terms of the kind of protections that we see, we see that for various protections under the 28 bilateral investment treaty that Ghana has signed so far, there are protections against discrimination. So then the government undertakes that is going to provide the same standard of treatment that it affords its nationals to foreign investors. There are also protections against expropriation, except for public purpose. And, and even for that one, it's, it's, it's also constitutionally guaranteed. And so apart from the fact that it's a protection afforded in bilateral in investment treaties, it's also contained within the 1992 constitution that the government cannot expropriate property without adequate compensation and except for public purpose. There are also protections related to the most favored national treatment where the government undertakes that it is going to provide the same level of protection that it affords to a third party that it has signed a bilateral agreement with, with an investor who also enters you know, into the country to do investments. Then, of course, there are protections for the resolution of disputes through arbitration. And like, I, like I've already indicated, Ghana being um, a signatory to the exit convention contains you know, that safeguard for investors to resolve their disputes through the exit mechanism. Okay. So are you, are you aware of instances of foreign investors actually pursuing claims against, against the government of Ghana? Yes. So there are, there are a number of cases where foreign investors have pursued claims against the government of Ghana. And one of them, if I do recall, is in 20, 2003, when the government of Ghana decided to change the management contracts for the national telecommunications company, which was then called um, Ghana Telecom. So there were Malaysian investors who had shareholdings within the, the, the company. And apart from that, I think they had been awarded a contract, a management contract over the company. And the government's decision to change management was something that they saw to be um, an indirect expropriation. And so they filed an exit claim. And from what I see from the records, it was settled. And in recent times, however, under the China Ghana BIT, there's, there's been two instances where uh, investors have brought a claim. So with Star Times versus Ghana, they also brought an application to the exit to enforce the provisions under the Ghana China BIT. And currently there's one which is also pending with every day, every way versus Ghana, where a contract with the Ministry of Roads and Highway for engineering and installation of traffic management system in Accra was cancelled and they have filed an application you know, over this for a $55 million contract which they want to enforce. So these are inst in in instances where we see foreign investors bring in claims. Uh, Isaac, that's really interesting what you mentioned about China. I think it particularly uh, given the fact that over the past decade or so, Chinese investment has been uh, been such such a big story and and such a so transformative in 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 many cases uh, a, a, across Africa, across uh, Central and South America, um, South Asia, and so on across the world. Uh, Chinese investments have have been immense, and it, you know it sounds as if there's been significant Chinese investment in Ghana as well. Um, but but I think you know if we what we're now seeing are instances of of Chinese uh, in, investors resorting to treaties to to enforce their disputes. Uh, that you know that that could be quite interesting and quite significant, and that in itself uh, I presume could drive uh, quite quite an increase uh, in in the volume of of treaty arbitrations. Uh, you know if if that is an indication of of how how Chinese uh, in, investors will be looking to to protect their investments you know as as obviously the global economic uh picture becomes becomes more difficult yeah yeah in fact for the start times case um the, the investor lost the matter 
And so we are looking forward to see what will happen in the everyday case. I think that the decisions that we've seen so far is the tribunal saying that this is not an investment treaty claim, this is a purely contractual claim. So we should have rather resorted to commercial arbitration and not an investment treaty arbitration. Oh, very interesting. So what, what are the key legal and commercial trends that, that you foresee uh, for Ghana in the future, other, other than what we've already discussed today? I know we, we've discussed a lot of that. Well, I think the key legal and commercial trend that we are likely to foresee for Ghana, particularly would revolve around, you know, regional trade or intercontinent, in, interregional trade. Ghana recently hosted the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, and it has actually started with, with Kenya importing its first consignment of batteries into Ghana quite recently, battery and tea, I believe. And so in the near in the foreseeable future, we'll see lots of commercial activities between Ghana and various African countries. And this in itself creates opportunities for transactional lawyers to do lots of business within Africa and even international lawyers as well, because there's also the likelihood that there will be disputes. I mean, whenever there's business, there's disputes. And so <laughs> you know, there's, there's the likelihood to be international arbitration going on in, in in the continent and in particular Ghana being the, the center of it. Then when we look at the extractive industry, Ghana recently discovered lithium in commercial quantities. The scoping report recently showed that it has a potential revenue of $4 billion. And I think that the company, when I checked today, has submitted an application for a mining license. So we also see that mining will also continue to play a predominant role within that space and it presents its opportunities particularly in respect of lithium and for its usage in the, in the country and across the world. Uh, thanks, Isaac. And in, in that context and against that background, uh, do you see international arbitration uh, remaining relevant in Ghana? Certainly, I, I, I do see international arbitration remaining relevant in Ghana. And it is actually now picking, picking up amongst practitioners in, in the country. Most lawyers in Ghana are seeking to develop their capacity you know, in international arbitration. And I also do see that this has been a call on the continent, particularly with Nigeria, where if I do recall, there's, 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 there's a kind of policy that is seeking to make Nigeria the host for every government contract that Nigeria enters into. And so, I mean, in that regard, international arbitration will remain relevant, not only in Ghana, but, but in Africa. And in this regard, I do know that there's going to be a conference of the African Arbitration Association, which I believe Kodo, you will be speaking. Uh, I'll be there in Accra and I'll be speaking. So yeah, around the time probably this, this episode goes out, uh, hopefully I'll be, be out in Accra, both reconnecting with the uh, Ghana legal community. Uh, I'll be well informed now, having spoken to you, Isaac, on uh, yeah. developments <laughs> out there and, and really yeah. look forward to part participating in that conference. I think it's going to be really exciting. So I think that about um, brings us uh, to a conclusion, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Isaac, I just want to say uh, thanks again for, for sharing your time, uh, your insights and your experiences. Um, listeners, I just, well, just to um, recap, uh, Isaac is uh, from a, a top um, top legal practice in Accra, Samuel Kujito and Associates, who, who have an, an, an excellent uh, international arbitration practice among many other excellent practices but I think that really came across uh, with the knowledge that, that Isaac was able to share with us today so thank you so much Isaac. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you Isaac. And thanks a lot Chucky, great to, uh, thank, to catch up thank again you. and, good, and thanks, for the, thanks for the suggestion of the title for this episode. I think Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Every, everything Ghana. <laughs> everything Ghana, thank you. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you have any suggestions for topics or want to reach Podresar Cody or Charles Harris, you can find them at the Mayor Brown website, mayorbrown.com. Also, to learn more about other Mayor Brown audio programs, please visit mayorbrown.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for listening.